Um, my name is Allison Harks, and I'm a park ranger at Lowell National Historical Park. I chose a Lowell background since we can't be all with each other today in Lowell. Um, but one of the benefits of this period is that we get to connect virtually with people. Typically, we do this program together in a private space in the park, and we have a public dialogue in the museum. Um, now we can open this up to people everywhere in the world who maybe can't visit us in Bowl. I also want to direct you to Allison Lang, who is our co-presenter today, and she'll be guiding us through the discussion on women's suffrage. I wanted to get us thinking about a few different things for this talk. We called it a movement and a pandemic uh, deliberately because that's what we're living through now and it's what people were living through a hundred years ago as well. Lowell famously sits at the confluence of two bodies of water and these are these two tremendously powerful natural forces that nonetheless are best known today for how people manage to work with them. And that's not unlike the forces that we have 100 to 105 years ago. In August 1920, the 19th Amendment was ratified. This means the right of citizens to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state on account of sex. There are many debates in subsequent decades as to how to uphold that right, and we will talk about that. Um, but in the years leading up to ratification, those few years right before, um, the world experienced what some have called the deadliest single event in recorded human history, so relatively recent history. This was a flu pandemic circa 1918. When we talk about that period, we're thinking about disease and we're thinking about democracy. We're talking a lot, unfortunately, about death and also about people who are disenfranchised, not just on account of sex. There's also these other events that surround this period, including the end of World War I. Here in Lowell, I chose this image because this is approximately the street uh, where local dissidents, including socialists, were actually hauled away as part of the Palmer raids. There's a tremendous amount of intense pressure and oppression in that period. And there's also something called the Red Summer, where there is a wave of white supremacist violence and racial terror enacted onto Black Americans. So we tend to think of things as threads in Lowell for many reasons. I kept thinking of this as a kind of knot that we're going to try to work with today. We can't understand these events without thinking about them together. At the same time, we're gonna look at a few of them closer so that we understand all of it better. Allison Lang is with us today. Um, she is in Massachusetts and so close, uh, typically we would have her jet right up to Lowell to be with us. She is an associate professor of history at the Wentworth Institute of Technology. She has her PhD from Brandeis University and her book, which is right behind her, um, beautiful purple and gold, is called Picturing Political Power, Images in the Women's Suffrage Movement. And it was published by University of Chicago Press in May 2020. Um, Allison focuses on the ways that women's rights activists and their opponents used images to define gender and power during the women's suffrage movement. Notably, right behind her head is a suffrage blue bird. Uh, she also was the guest curator for Can She Do It? Massachusetts Debates a Women's Right to Vote with the Massachusetts Historical Society in 2019. Um, so if we can get started, if you could tell us a bit about your background um, and what motivated you to write about images with the women's suffrage movement. Yes, thank you so much for that lovely introduction. I'm really excited to talk about both of these two strands of this really complicated moment uh, with you and everyone who's joining us today. And um, I think that I got to images early on. Um, I'm really interested in visual material culture in general. Um, I actually did like my undergraduate thesis on octagonal houses, where, which were a shockingly <laughs> popular thing in the mid 19th century. So I really loved the kind of stuff of history um, a lot. 
And when I in graduate school, um, the there were a ton of new digitization efforts. So I started graduate school in 2008. So a lot of places were putting a lot of amazing new materials online that um, really had never been quite so accessible before. And the Library of Congress in particular um, put a lot of materials online. They created a collection called Women of Protest, which you could still, um, if you Google search that, you can find that um, even now. The photographs of the women in front of the White House, as I was kind of just browsing around, trying to think of like, you know, what kinds of sources interested me, where I wanted my dissertation to go. Um, those were images that really just stuck out to me. And when you're looking at um, the way that uh, suffragists were kind of representing themselves over the time period. Um, that is, these these photographs of women at the White House really stand out. Um, yeah, it's, re it's really um, shocking to see these women at the White House in a way that uh, they certainly were never doing that. Um, yeah, so th these photographs really stood out to me. The fact that they hired professional photographers um, and decided to have them come out and photograph them. Um, and um, the fact that these are the first ever pickets of the White House. Um, we kind of, if you've ever been to the White House area today, it, like, you know, or in the past, you know, decade or longer, the White House is often a site for protest. And um, the suffragists were really the ones that made it that way. So we we talked at the beginning, and I'll try to get that beep to go away also. Um, there's these different events all happening at the same time, um, one of which is this very deadly flu pandemic, um, which people start to first recognize around this time in 1918. So really very close in the timeline. Um, and you've done a lot of work lately on how these end up kind of dovetailing together. So what is the kind of impact of this flu pandemic on that national level? Yes, so I think that's a really important point to make, right? So all of these things are happening at the same time. Often when we think about the past, we kind of like focus on one particular component, um, but in August, 1918, uh, there's a lot happening. So within the suffrage movement, um, there's a lot of momentum to um, pass women's voting rights. So most uh, several states had already passed women's suffrage um, laws by that time. Most kind of famously and, and really uh, important for the momentum was the passage of New York State um, in 1917. And so women were voting, were able to vote actually in 1918 for the first time. So that's happening. Um, and so seeing this major, po very populated state um, passing it um, really helped galvanize people. Um, suffragists are lobbying in the state, in the in national, in Washington, D.C. And they are national representatives because they needed to win over Congress in order to pass the national amendment. They're winning over national representatives and they are also winning over the president at that time. And so at this particular moment, um, we think about uh, the ways that then this August flu comes around. It starts out in Kansas in the United States and spreads far beyond it. Um, by October, it has hit Washington, D.C., um, and in fact, um, soon after the amendment is kind of brought up, the the Capitol has to co close down a bit and they close the gallery to Congress because they see how devastating this flu is um, at that time. And so we see this kind of confluence of events, the flu happening, you know, suffrage activism happening. This was, of course, this moment where the um, World War I is, is closing out and they're trying to negotiate what, what the post-World War I uh, world is going to look like. And so all of these things are happening all at the same time. Um, so the suffragists getting a lot um, in this moment. And this is, you know, an example of the images that I was mentioning earlier that really inspired me to think about suffrage. I'm sure that this is, you know, this is a fairly fa famous photograph. Um, but for me, the thing that stood out was, you know, why did they choose to stage it this way and have these professional photographers? And we could talk more about that. Um, but one of the things when I was doing a little bit of research um, earlier in the pandemic that really just stood out to me immediately 
um, was this quote, um, everything conspires against women's suffrage. And um, in you know, March and April, uh, when we were starting up um, at this, um, in our own pandemic situation, and I was seeing all the suffrage centennial events that we've been working for many years to coordinate, this one really resonated with me. I could imagine, you know, how suffragists who were, um, who had been working not only for years, but actually decades, um, almost a century to make this happen. I could imagine how this woman, Florence Huberwald, might have felt in October of 1918 as she was seeing, you know, everything kind of um, collapse around her. Um, and people were really debating what to do next. And so um, this is an example of, you know, suggesting that suffragists were, were not wearing masks. Um, the article itself actually goes on to say that the suffragists were social distancing in this space. And so I do wonder, um, you know, it's like today, right? Um, they were setting up their chairs really far apart. They probably felt like they were, you know, following some of the guidelines, but just not all of the guidelines. And I think that we can, um, we can really relate to the complicated um, dynamics of which guidelines to follow, which ones are the right ones, getting like, concerned about following them. And so they were still meeting. They were still, there are plenty of meetings and conventions canceled because of this, um, but there were plenty of women who kept on kept on working to try to make sure that um, they, were, they were being heard. And one of the ways they kept working was by supporting World War I. Um, they acted as nurses and this became a really crucial part of this 1918 and 1919 pandemic moment, right? So they started off by um, having the National American Women's Suffrage Association actually set up uh, hospitals overseas. Um, and so they were putting suffragists and um, training them overseas, raising money for them um, to support this war effort. And one of the reasons they did this was actually because there was a popular anti-suffrage argument that because women did not support the military, were not part of the military, that they really weren't, yeah, they really shouldn't be able to vote on the same level either. That was a really popular argument, you know, from the earliest um, years of debating suffrage. And so one of the goals of having women um, as act as nurses was to show that they were really important contributing citizens. And even if they weren't necessarily soldiers, they were really a major part of this war effort. And, you know, there are some uh, cartoons from this time period. This is called The Weaker Sex. And it says a quote from anti-suffragist, women's place is in the home, and yet we see this female nurse off to war who's helping this soldier. And so we see this contrast of um, the ways that the suffragists are kind of trying to counter that very popular um, argument about women's military service in general. Um, and so this is an example of, you know, a, a poster, propaganda poster to kind of invite people to become, uh, invite women in particular to become nurses. Um, it's this door of opportunity. And um, this is an opportunity that um, was certainly particularly available to women who had some access to education. Um, and as you can see from the poster, it was really um, pulling in a lot of white women at this time. Um, but there were actually a lot of women of color, um, Black women, who were able to break into this gradually. And actually, the 1918 flu pandemic really helped open the door for them in a way that even World War I did not. The American Red Cross officially said that they would allow Black women to be deployed overseas, but they never actually did that. Um, it took the 1918 pandemic to actually um, deploy Black women as nurses across the United States and really broke barriers. It, it paved the way for having Black female nurses um, be central to Red Cross and nursing efforts long after the 1918 pandemic. So it really was um, a, a door to them as well. And ultimately, I really think it's important that we think about this, you know, the ways this influenced the ways that um, really leading public figures actually talked about the suffrage movement. 
right? So in 1918, Woodrow Wilson finally, you know, pushes Congress to support the war effort, to, to support suffrage. And this is just an excerpt from his um, speech, but he says, shall we admit them only to a partnership of suffering and sacrifice and toil and not to a partnership of privilege and right? And then he asks at the very bottom of this particular quote, this measure, which I urge upon you is vital to the winning of the war. And so he also this as a, um, a a war measure, essentially, right? This is something that women, you know, should receive um, as a thank you for all of their contributions during this period. And so we see all of these um, uh, images of women after that, you know, really being a, a significant part of this flu pandemic. I mean, I think that you know, in the 21st century, we know um, we have a sense of just how vital nurses are to our own pandemic. Um, this is, uh, you know, doctors are incredibly important in helping to kind of create treatment plans and things, but nurses are the ones who are constantly checking on people and doing a lot of the, the, the basic work to help um, help infected um, people who are trying to, to, trying to recover. And so when we're thinking about that, um, we can see um, how these, how these suffragists were really, how these women's rights activists were really vital uh, to this moment. So with everything you're describing too, and I'll just tell you, so Brandon and I were actually looking yesterday at, you know, women specifically affected by the flu and, and different people in the community. And I think it's relatable in a different way than it was six, eight months ago. These compounding effects of major global pandemic compounded with war, you know, factors that we face today as well. And then this fight, right, for voting rights, basic citizenship access um, to being part of a democracy. And it kind of got us thinking, there had to be some mixed feelings, right, by August of 1920, that in the same way that there is some ambiguity right leading up to this centennial that people must have also had a kind of strange national mood in august 1920 as well right i mean certainly there were you know like you know imagine that that everyone was just like oh yes of course we're all celebrating this you know major achievement this major milestone um but in fact we know that um Anti-suffragists were still pushing to try and ensure that uh, they could actually, uh, they, they still tried to, to kind of, a Supreme Court case came up um, to try and challenge it. Um, Tennessee tried at one point to rescind its ratification, right? So like, it's not just, you know, the 19th Amendment passes and it's done. And um, especially with the pandemic happening, people were really, uh, by, by August 1920, it's not as much of a concern. Um, a lot of women did actually cast a ballot in November of 1920 that year in the presidential election. Um, but uh, there, it's still a major, a moment of major change. I wanted to get into a little bit how studying this has felt different over the past few months. Yeah, it feels very different. I will say that um, I, suffrage historians have like barely if ever discussed the way the 1918 pandemic influenced the movement and living through this moment makes me realize that that's a mistake um not to recognize the fact that um, these activists were trying to negotiate um such serious health issues in this in the in the final <laughs> months of this uh move and what ended up being the final months of this movement and so it's really incredible it's even more incredible now that they were able to kind of figure out how to get their message out there and still um, keep pushing. I mean, even if they felt like everything conspired against women's suffrage, um, they still kept pushing. And so that's, I think, like a, a really nice thing to take away. That feels, um, I think that there's now going to be a lot more um, in the future, a lot more books that when they're talking about World War One and the ways that World War One uh, contributed to the passing of the 19th Amendment, I think that people will um, be far more inclined to mention at least the 1918 pandemic. 
may end up getting like a, a book on the 1918 pandemic and suffrage out of this. I wouldn't be surprised. Some, you know, amazing uh, scholar hopefully is starting work on that. Um, yeah, it, it feels it feels like I'm a little bit more connected to them in a, in a, in a way. And the question is from Kevin from Lowell, which is how did empire consolidation in World War I require political and ideological support by middle class or petite bourgeoisie and bourgeoisie women? Um, so kind of getting at this aspect that you mentioned briefly with the photos, that backlash against women who were anti-war and that need to galvanize support amongst not, not even wealthier women, but even middle class women for the war. Yeah, support and the lack of support for the war was a topic that really did suffragists during World War One. I. I mean, I mentioned the women of the National American Women Suffrage Association who, who did decide to go overseas, did decide to support the war effort, um, but there was certainly a debate among suffragists about whether that was the right choice to do. Um, one thing that they thought of was the ways that, um, of course, after, during the Civil War, um, a lot of the previous generation of suffragists um, did mobilize to support that effort. And a lot of them were incredibly angry and frustrated and disappointed when the aftermath of that war did not um, uh, lead to their winning of the vote. Um, and so they saw World War I, or many people like Carrie Chapman Catt, the head of the National American Women Suffrage Association, saw World War I as something essential. They had to participate or else they would not be part of these kind of post-war conversations at all. In contrast, though, Jane Addams, who um, was a leading political figure of the era, um, she was very much a pacifist, and there were plenty of other suffragists just like her. She actually is the first American woman to have won the Nobel Peace Prize, and she certainly um, was not, um, even if she supported kind of efforts that would ultimately advance suffrage, she was very much a, a, in opposition to the war. And so I think that's a really important point to think about the ways that, you know, um, the ways that the suffragists were very much divided on that ultimate topic. Although, however, you know, it, it, ultimately these leading political figures like Woodrow Wilson, but also plenty of um, other representatives um, really pointed to that war service um, as something essential in those final years. And if you're interested in reading more about it, um, the curator at the National Portrait Gallery, Kate LeMay, actually just wrote a spectacular op-ed for um, CNN. And you can do a quick Google search to, to find that. No one builds uh, monuments to pacifists generally, right? You know, so right. there, there's also a kind of missing link with with local memory, which impacts the way people think of that period, right? So kind of as if there's a universal support. Now, I know that you've done a tremendous amount of work on the state. And again, you have your bluebird behind you. The question from Emily was, um, the, the question is, is to Allison, which is half of this call. Um, how Lowell women organized and work for suffrage um, and information outside of Lowell or just kind of outside of Boston, what that Massachusetts scene kind of looked like. So maybe Allison, you can speak to a Lowell a little bit, but I can talk a little bit about just Massachusetts as a whole, um, which is, um, and if you're interested, if you go to Massachusetts debates, the women's right, women's right to vote um, hosted by the Massachusetts Society, you can see the digital version of the exhibition we created. Um, and one of the things that I think is really important to understand about Massachusetts is that although we have um, some of the leading women's rights activists in the 19th century who are living here, who are um, organizing the American Women's Suffrage Association in 1870, um, Lucy. Henry Brown Blackwell, many other um, Americans, and then, of course, the, the, the women who become founders of the National Association of Colored Women, jo Josephine Ruffin and her daughter. Um, despite the fact that we have this great legacy of co-suffragists here, um, actually, Massachusetts is where the very first anti-suffrage organization is 
uh, different from maybe what we expect to have happen in Massachusetts. But um, women were act actually um, advocating against the right to vote. Um, the Massachusetts Historical Society is on Boylston Street in Fenway, and that was just down the street of where the um, Massachusetts Anti-Suffrage Association headquarters was, which may be why they have a lot of their papers. Um, and so there's, um, in Massachusetts even, there's a, a lot of debate about whether women should vote. Do you think, you know, obviously there's a connection where the anti-suffrage is, is popping up in a direct and in a geographical relationship to a strong suffrage movement, but do you think there are other factors that kind of motivate Massachusetts women for any reason? I think that that is one reason why, right? So if there are a lot of suffragists there, then there's it feels more necessary to create an organization to oppose them. I think that that's a major reason. The other reason why is because in 1895, it was founded because there was a referendum about whether women should be able to vote. Uh, the suffragists organized to ensure that that referendum failed um, and they were very successful. Um, they argued that if people, if women didn't come out to vote in this election, which they were actually able, allowed to do in that 1895 referendum, um, that that meant that they didn't want the ballot. And so a lot of women did not turn out um, a, even far more. The women who did turn out voted overwhelmingly in favor of suffrage, but um, the men who did turn out voted, voted overwhelmingly against it. I think it's it's hard to think of people who are antis believing in something, but they also kind of have their own ideology, right? In the same way that pacifists are not just against war, they have their own background, right? Their own sense. And, you know, to the question of Lowell, it was mentioned in the chat and I highly recommend it. We worked as a team to develop a website on women's activism in Lowell. And part of why the title wasn't just focused on suffrage or that 19 teens movement, is a lot of events that happened here almost a century before set the stage um, for organizing that becomes the suffrage movement. There's a tremendous amount of activity among working class women here in the 1830s and 40s. And a kind of superficial look at that activism would tell you that it failed, right? Because a lot of their protests and their strikes didn't meet their achieved goals, right? They, they wanted to achieve certain things and they didn't need them. Um, but a lot of the women, Harriet Hanson Robinson is a great example. They're so changed by this experience of being part of a movement that they then get involved in women's suffrage or other courses um, or other paths, sorry, um, in part because it changes them. And I think there's also something to an energy of a city that there are certain places where women's suffrage really gains traction and some places that it doesn't. Um, a very early women's historian was writing about Lowell and said one of the, the, the true things that you can identify about some of the weaknesses of the later women's suffrage movement is that there were no aunties because they didn't have to bother, which is really interesting. <laughs> um, so the question was about the URL of that site, and that's pretty easy to access. It's right on our webpage and um, nps.gov slash Lowell. And a lot of that has also been turned into a walking tour of downtown Lowell. And I'll just say, you don't have to be here to do that. You can also just kind of read and, and listen along. So um, we had a comment from Martha about the Massachusetts legislature. Um, which was to push for allowing women to vote for local school committees. Um, mm -hmm. And a woman ran for Lowell School Committee as early as 1882. Yeah, and I think that's a really important point to, to remember that, you know, we think often about the 19th Amendment and then maybe we recognize that states pass suffrage, but even more locally, school board, a lot of places were where women could vote first. Um, sometimes then they could vote in municipal elections for mayor, um, and then sometimes just presidential elections, and sometimes just state elections. It was 
really like a real patchwork. Um, and yes, in Massachusetts, um, women could vote um, quite early on in, um, in school board elections. You know, people made the case that because women had children and cared for their children, that certainly um, they should have a voice um, in these elections. So we got a question from Anne, which is a great question uh, about what the roles that non-Yankee, non-Protestant women played in the women's suffrage movement, and especially in Lowell. Um, would you like to take on that as a national question first, and then we can talk a bit about the local picture? Sure, yeah. So there are um, a lot of women who don't often make the spotlight um, that kind of uh, that, that speak to your point, right? So, um, and in fact, there's a amazing suffrage section in the New York Times today that, for example, has an article about queer women in the suffrage movement. Um, and there's been a lot done about particularly Black women in the suffrage movement in the last um, few months. That's really easily accessible online. Um, and in fact, I curated a digital exhibition called um, Truth Be Told that really tells the story of the suffrage movement, particularly by looking at um, the ways that Black women were participants, were not just participants, but leaders. Um, so when we're thinking about kind of non-Northeastern, non um, non-Protestant women, um, basically uh, women from every group and background absolutely were participating in the suffrage movement. Um, when we're thinking about, you know, when we look at California, if you look at the history of suffrage in California, you'll find um, Chinese American women in, uh, voting. You'll find that that there are actually is um, like in, in Mandarin um, advocating for the vote. Um, you'll also find across the country um, various propaganda in different languages. So it certainly was not just um, these elite white women from the Northeast, even though those are the, the women whose names we most often remember. Um, and if you're interested in kind of just looking into a few people who um, might um might be exciting. Um, Mabel Lee is one worse, one person I would recommend checking out. Um, Adelina Otero Warren is really interesting. She was from New Mexico. Um, and uh, Mary Church Terrell is another one of my favorites. The, there's a new, the first ever biography of her coming out later this year. And she lived from 1863 through 1958-ish, I think. And um, so she was not only a suffragist, but she was actually picketing uh, segregated restaurants in Washington, D.C. well into her 80s. <laughs> so we had some follow-up questions on that. Um, one from Anne being about Irish women and particularly in relationship to religion, right? Like how these different things intersect. And I'll just say before we get into Irish women specifically, one of the challenges of this, looking at this time period is Lowell has all these different social movements that are in some ways intersecting and in some ways fighting for power together or in opposition to each other. Um, there are women who are not necessarily interested in being part of the institution. They're not necessarily looking for access to mainstream power. They're anarchists or they're socialists, and they're looking to change the system. And when we look at the years right before the ratification, Lowell and many other communities that are working class I don't even think it's as simple as any specific group or any specific neighborhood, because when they do a referendum and they go ward by ward in the city, you can't even map ethnicity or religion onto yes or no. It's an incredibly split moment because you have some people who are incredibly radical, who may be part of an established church, but part of their faith pushes them to be radicals. Later, you see this with people like Dorothy Day um, and other folks who visit strikes in Lowell, but I don't know that it's necessarily a sort of conservative or radical or progressive. You have all these things kind of clashing with each other, at least in Lowell. Yeah, I would agree. I think that it's, um, Although we think of kind of a lot of elite white women who are opposing the movement, there were a lot of elite white women 
who were contributing significant amounts of money uh, to push forward this cause. If For those of us in the New England era, if you have ever been to and gone to Marble House, which was owned by Alva Belmont, um, she hosted suffrage fundraisers there. That was very essential. And do you know if the church had a, adopted a, the Catholic church had adopted a formal position on this? Has that come up for you? That I don't know. I don't know the answer. Yes, we're focusing on from the beginning because I think it's important to remember that suffrage was like one plank in a larger push for women's rights and was certainly women's leadership in the church. And so um, this was something that wasn't necessarily the focus of their national movement, but would have been happening on a much more local um, kind of uh, within their own uh, faith kind of level. Thinking too, there is an excellent set of resources on the Rogers School, which was a school for women in Lowell. And the students actually did a poll amongst themselves of graduates right around 1920. And one of the things they found was that there's not a set pattern, right? Like certain people believe this, certain people believe this. They were also tabulating how many of their peers could vote before 1920 as in how many moved to places where they could get the right to vote through their state. Um, and so part of what's interesting is there's also this kind of comment in passing amongst these Rogers School students that they participate in a suffrage float um, right in downtown Lowell. And some of the women in the recollections, they write about how they did it because they kind of felt bad for their teacher who was very into it. And I think that also points to this kind of interesting thing of you can be a very politically active person and people might even feel this now, but not feel specifically drawn to a specific amendment, right? Or to something that feels so big and outside of you. Um, you have people who are fighting for better working conditions, who are very focused on their deliberate needs. Um, I'm thinking also with the church specifically in Lowell, and it's a really great question, thinking of some of the work and, and different resources we've looked at uh, surrounding the 1892-93 Columbian Exposition and some of the work that young women did in support of that. Um, and the ways that women often, they get pulled into these kind of nationalist projects, but what did they actually believe? Right? Like, what did they really feel about their place in this country? And we know that with some of these people, they're drawn to anarchist causes. Some of them are drawn to mainstream progressive politics. We know that the postcard image that I used and the location that's right outside my window, these are places that suffrage activists would come and they would speak directly to workers. And a big part of their targeting was convincing men who could already vote to vote in favor of women's suffrage. And, you know, we've all run unsuccessful events. When you do the write-up, what will you say about that day? Will you focus on the negative or the positive? It's very hard to know how a lot of those conversations actually went with those people. We're relying on their sources. So that's a challenge, too. Definitely. And there were a lot of um, a lot of suffrage parades, you know, more local ones in Lowell. Um, certainly, I'm very confident that local Lowell suffragists would have gone to the big ones in Boston um, that happened in 1914 and 1915, sadly nicknamed the Victory Parade that did not lead to a victory. <laughs> Massachusetts referendum. Um, but I'm they they pulled people from all over the state um, for even those kind of major organizations, major uh, parades, yeah. Now, Bridget was asking if you could mention some of those names again. I think when you were talking like Mary Church Terrell, and, and I'll type them so that people can look up yeah. more information. That's great. So one place that might be a good place to even start looking for them is actually the Suff Buffs blog. Um, which is the Women's Suffrage Centennial Commission. So U.S. Congress, is, um, US Congress put money towards getting historians to write 
um, about um, Adelina Otero Warren, you will find her like a, an, a lovely um, short blog post um, by Kathleen Cahill, who's a historian at Penn State, wrote about her. Um, you'll also find out about Mabel Lee there as well, who is a Chinese suffragist. Um, she um, did a lot of work in New York. Um, she was one of the earliest Chinese American women to um, earn a PhD and she earned it in economics actually. Um, and also Mary Church Terrell. You'll find um, short, really great posts about each of those women um, on that website. Now, when you do your work, a lot of your, your research is about visuals and thinking of some of your early work about Sojourner Truth and the way that she was very smart about using her own visual, right, as, as part of getting people to understand and access something about why citizenship needed to be broadened and, and more equitable. How do you balance kind of getting away from these stars of the women's suffrage movement to understand some of these more, I don't, I don't want to say commonplace experiences, but it is very hard with the way that people kind of establish themselves as leaders, people like Elizabeth Cady Stanton, to understand what was happening around them. I think that's true. Um, and I think that, you know, often it is easiest for us to kind of find the papers of Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Um, to at least find um, Sojourner Truth's biography, um, we have that from her, although they, she could not read or write, so we don't have um, too much else that's literally just from her. Um, and so it is sometimes to understand how kind of like more ordinary citizens were engaging with them. I mean, that's actually why I love studying images, because... They get published, they're fairly informal. They get published in these, you know, very cheap newspapers. Um, and you kind of get a sense of, you know, what do the artists and the editors, the publishers, like think will interest their audience? Mm. You know, these anti-suffrage cartoons, um, which there are a ton of, of cartoons that oppose women's voting rights. They really represented these women as masculine, as ugly, as women who were going to reject home life. Um, they're actually, I wrote an essay for the National Park Service, um, and I'm blanking on the precise title. It's like um, something about mannish radicals to kind of like feminist heroes. Um, and so it really will give you kind of some examples of these, you know, anti-suffrage cartoons. And so you get a sense of you know, throughout the 19th century, there are so many people that oppose women's rights. You know, most newspapers publish these. These are just, you know, part of the air that everyone is breathing. Everyone supports it. it they certainly wouldn't be publishing them in something they wanted to sell. <laughs> so that, we, we do get a sense of, like, what Americans think. And it's not until the 1910s when the popular press, kind of like your, your mainstream press, like, kind of like the Boston Globe or other kind of comparable papers actually do start really publishing a lot of pro suffrage material. And so that's, that is where we get like a little bit broader sense of these people. I think it's also really important that the suffragists decided to distribute these portraits though, mm -hmm. even if it does make it harder for us to kind of find the people um, around them. Um, they were living in a moment when um, the women were not public figures, um, you know, most women were not public figures. Maybe you'd have a Jenny Lind, you know, this famous opera singer come through and everyone would be, you know, dying to see her. Um, but they were incredibly few and far between. Um, so they really felt like it was very important that um, they were seen as public figures. They were seen as leaders, um, as, as political leaders. Um, which is really pretty normal to us today, right? You know, we just got, you know, the nomination of Kamala Harris to be on um, a vice presidential ticket, which is still, you know, news making even in 2020. Um, but I think that that kind of representation is um, more common to us today. And when you're talking about this too, I'm, I'm thinking of some projects that we're working on here at the park and, you know, one of the more, I would say, important and foundational women's activists from the city is someone who started as a worker in Lowell. Um, her name is Sarah Bagley, and she goes on to be a female editor of The Voice of Industry, which is a labor paper, and works in all these very important causes. 
no known likeness of her. And that it's not actually that uncommon, right? And we, we do this work to uncover different stories or to try to understand. And sometimes we're working with these kind of painfully small scraps about people. And I think what a difference it might make, even though we shouldn't have to have it to have a visual, right? Like the way that an icon becomes an icon, what a difference, right? It really does make a huge difference, right? I mean, thinking about documentaries, I mean, probably, you know, documentaries or museum exhibitions or even these digital sort of things, the chance to look at in this moment. I think that um, it's really hard to um, kind of, you know, create engaging content, even if we're thinking about it from that perspective, without really seeing what these people looked like. And I think that your point is also important because when we're thinking about someone like Sojourner Truth versus someone like Susan B. Anthony, you know, Sojourner Truth was the one who basically by hand distributed her portrait. And when you look at um, a lot of really important archives across the United States, a lot of them have portraits of Sojourner Truth, which just gives us a sense of how many she distributed. Um, whereas someone like Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, they actually published books with their portraits in it. They actually sold them through their newspaper and they never did that for truth. So they really worked to create this very particular idea of who a suffragist was. And for them, that was a white woman. That was a fairly well-educated woman, um, well off enough woman that she's not having to kind of be a domestic servant in order to support herself. So, um, so I think that thinking about those, how we got to become so famous, how we got to have so many of their portraits mm -hmm. in our archives is really vital. You know, you can't help but think too that this is a burden of people who are not believed also, right? Like this, this burden to present and be presented a specific way is something that burdens people, not just in a way that's gendered, but I'm, I'm thinking all the time about the Lewis Hine photos because I think a part of you, once you see documentation of children's labor, it's harder to think about it in a rational and detached way because another person's eyes have looked back to you, right? Or, or you have been given a texture to the past that you didn't have before. And I, I think that's often a burden that's so uneven in the United States. Like some people are believed and some people have to prove, right? their humanity, like prove their situation, and that visuals have become such a compelling way for us to do that. And I, I'm, you know, probably improperly putting that burden on these 19th century activists when their word would have been enough, right? Like their word should be enough, but the visual is so compelling. Yeah, I think that even though in the 19th century, they definitely edited photographs, they added clouds, they took out wrinkles, <laughs> um, you know, they do, do even more in the 21st century with photographs, but um, people really still approach photographs, even today, with like a sense of realism. Like even though we know that they probably added an extra like glow to someone's face or whatever, um, we kind of um, still see these as kind of ideals um, and, and authentic images. Um, but one of the things, you know, one of the early ways that images are used to kind of change minds, and I think Lewis Hine is definitely a kind of like descendant of this idea, is, is in the anti-slavery movement. Mm. I mean, that's where these early women's rights activists are kind of saying, look how effective it is to show, there was a very famous photograph of a man who was enslaved, who was showing his scars, um, and it was reproduced um, in illustrated newspapers. And um, it was that photograph that people thought was just as powerful, actually, as Uncle Tom's Cabin mm -hmm. by Harry Beecher Stowe um, for kind of winning people over to fight against slavery. And so, yes, these photographs, once you see them, they can change your mind. And Sojourner Truth was hoping to do that with her portrait, right? She's trying to demonstrate that she's the dignified woman. She is not look anything like the anti-suffragist cartoons. She looks nothing like the racist stereotypes. You have to believe her when you see this portrait, right? 
Now, Emily has given us some amazing resources and she's absolutely right in the chat that Instagram has a lot of work happening around women's suffrage, um, that you are on Instagram at Professor Lang, um, but also to look at something like the National Women's History Museum and the different kind of visual work that is happening there. I think about the past few months, the way that um, Breonna Taylor's name, right, has become such an important part of the visual culture of a lot of people's social media experience, um, but also the way people have already been critical of that to say, you know, a person is not a meme. And, and we're, we're in some ways looking at her as a direct line back to Sojourner Truth marketing and selling visuals of herself to prove that she's a person, I feel like that echo is so strong, right? Like with what we're living through today. Yeah, there are a lot of echoes between thinking about these early women's rights activists and what's happening right now. And when I think about that, I also think about Brianna Noble. And if you look up her photograph with the um, and connect it to, I think, the Black Lives Matter movement, I'm trying to think of like what the title of the article is. I don't remember. But the Lily, um, the Washington Post kind of subsection that's focused on um, women's rights, um, published this fantastic piece kind of connecting that to Inez Milholland, an early suffragist mm -hmm. who... Um, both of them rode a horse and um, to protest, right? So Inez Mulholland is advocating for suffrage and Breonna Noble is advocating for Black Lives Matter. But yes, there are even these visual parallels um, between, you know, over a century. And I think another example of that is the, the big Black Lives Matter that was painted right outside of the White House. And yet another kind of emphasis on the White House as being this really central political space. Um, which this, you know, really made it that way just over a century ago. Did have a question uh, from Joan actually, where did Massachusetts fall in the lineup of states to ratify? They ratified actually fairly early on. So uh, we have at least have that to, to celebrate. They ratified in June of uh, 1919, I believe. So so that so, so even if they opposed suffrage, you were the first group to uh, to oppose suffrage. Um, they came around. <laughs> I'll just show one visual uh, very quickly. I was collecting different views of Lowell around the time um, of 1920, and thinking about these young people who lived here, and as we've you know discussed on and off of this program, just thinking about how much their world changed in a few years, and also thinking about the way that as a culture, we maybe still haven't reckoned with some of those changes. Um, we have, as I mentioned, more than 50 memorials, and rightfully so, to service members from World War I, and almost nothing about the losses from the flu pandemic. And we do have monuments to women in Lowell, and those are incredibly important. But thinking about the decades of work that went into this movement and the fights that are still so intense over ways to commemorate that or where to commemorate it, um, the lack of statuary dedicated to suffragists and the few that there are not representing working class culture. Um, these are just a few snapshots of women's life around this time, and you can imagine how much their world changed in just those few months. Um, again, a, a far more relatable experience than I think we would like to have today. Where did the text come from? I'll just answer that. So that is from one of the Rogers School books, which is digitized, and I'm happy to send you a link. And it was the women from Rogers School polling their classmates what they thought about suffrage and how many of them could actually vote. Yeah, I think that, you know, when we're thinking about like closing things, you know, things that I might take away from learning about the suffrage movement, um, one of the things I really appreciated was just how long it took them to win this right. And as we know, the 19th Amendment was not the end of the voting rights story. Um, a lot of women of color, Native American women weren't even citizens in 1920, so they certainly couldn't vote. Um, same with Mabel Lee, the Chinese American woman who I mentioned earlier, she could not vote after 1920. 
Um, plenty of Black men and women in the South um, couldn't vote until the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And so when we're thinking about this, I think that one of the really exciting things, uh, inspiring thing and, and hopeful things is to remember that change takes a really long time. And if the change that you might want to see doesn't happen immediately, you kind of just have to keep going and it might um, it might take a while. And I think that's a really great reminder to us. The other thing is that the vote is incredibly important and incredibly powerful because if it weren't either of those things, then no one would have cared if women had the right to vote or not. Um, and we certainly wouldn't still be having conversations, you know, um, even in a few months before the next election about who should be able to vote, who should be um, allowed to register, who should be able to cast ballot, how we're able to cast ballots. Um, that would not be part of our conversation at all if it weren't such a vital thing. There are tremendous resources that were digitized by archivists, librarians, and historians in Lowell. And whenever we do this kind of work, we're standing on their shoulders to make it accessible and just to connect people to that history. I would definitely recommend checking out that section of our website also if this is of interest to you and to kind of stay posted to different things that we're doing to keep this conversation about suffrage relevant to 2020. So thank you all so much for coming. Yes, thank you for hosting. It's been wonderful to, to chat with all of you today.